let's, let's get started. Thank you for finding your way to this uh, venue. I know you, most of you are used to the uh, one downstairs and that this is a little bit um, difficult to find, but it's our preferred venue for many reasons. I, am, I wanted to uh, have a few reflections to start with. Um, the first is, I was thinking about all of the events that this center and the prior center at NYU have done over the past um, uh, year since Guantanamo opened in January of 2002. And um, I realized that we really haven't done anything on Guantanamo, which is surprising considering we write about it, we think about it. I tried to talk to as many people who are in, in the conversation about Guantanamo, but focusing on it and knowing how to focus on it is, is very difficult. And I think one of the reasons has everything to do with where we stand today at Guantanamo. And that is that as worthy and as earnest and as, as hard fighting um, about the injustices at Guantanamo, uh, so many of the advocates, journalists, experts, lawyers, and others have been, there's been a gap between the idea that these are human beings at Guantanamo and, um, and, and the public conversation. And it's bothered me the whole time, and I'm sure it's bothered others. So what has actually brought the United States finally to pay attention in, in May of 2013 to Guantanamo Bay in a way that it hasn't been paying attention before? Uh, part, of it is, um, part of it is some reports that have come out. Part of it are things like Harold Coe's um, remarks the other day at the Oxford Union about uh, closing Guantanamo. But really what happened was the New York Times published an op-ed piece uh, written by a detainee about what it meant to be at Guantanamo, the hopelessness, the despair, and the reality of the hunger strike. And it changed the conversation. The conversation went from being among 2,000 of us, or 400 of us, to a nationwide conversation. And we're going to see more of that. You, we're going to see more detainee voices, or we're going to see more, I hate to use this category, but it's the right one, victim voices. Just like we heard in Congress on the predator uh, killing strikes and hearing individuals from the region who have suffered and whose families have suffered under these strikes. In other, in other words, it's not just about theories of justice. It's not just about international relations. It's not just about who we think we are as a nation. It is about people who now have been in custody for a very long time without knowing where they are headed, or if they are ever headed somewhere. So I thought it was an appropriate time to convene a panel of people who have spent the better part of the last decade thinking about this. So they, they could share with you from the point of view of the detainees, as well as from the point of view of on the ground reporting from Guantanamo, what this story actually looks like, what we're missing, what we need to know, and how maybe to think about uh, end game and, and last steps. This, this is what I would consider the perfect panel, and I know I always think we have perfect panels. This is, this is really um, one that, that I think you will um, learn a great deal from. And you have their biographies, but I will introduce them um, briefly, and then we will get to the program. The first one is somebody who's really new to the center, and so I wanted to focus on him a little bit, Dr. Gerald Thompson. And the reason he's here is that the Constitution Project last month released a task force report on detention policy. And I urge you all to go online and to read it. Um, and it is a sweeping bipartisan, or I would say all partisan, it's not really bipartisan, it's, it's many different perspectives, um, many of whose pe people on the commission whose names you would know, who's, who uh, collected information, made recommendations, I think it's 24 recommendations, on detention policy throughout the world, the United States detention policy in Afghanistan, at the black site, in Guantanamo, elsewhere, and something that is the first thorough report we've had on this, and the recommendations are just like so much of the public discourse now about how to take future steps to make sure this doesn't happen again. It's not focused on accountability. It's not focused on punitive measures. It's focused on what went wrong um, in terms of, of creating these policies and 
how to prevent it in the future. And so I thought it would be nice to have somebody from that commission, and I thought it would be extremely valuable to have a doctor. Because much of the report and much of what we know about the issue and much of the hunger strikes we're going to talk about today will focus on, on the, med the role of the medical um, physicians in this. Um, and also about the viability of being on a hunger strike and, and what the prognosis is. Uh, Jer Dr. Thompson is the Samuel Lambert and Robert Sonneborn Professor of Medicine Emeritus at Columbia University. He was the Director of Medicine at Harlem <coughs> Hospital. He was the Executive Vice President and Chief of Staff at Columbia University Medical Center. And he was the Senior Associate Dean at the College of Physicians and Surgeons at Columbia. It's really wonderful and inspiring that somebody of that, this uh, degree of accomplishment um, would, is willing to think about Guantanamo and, and look at the difficulties that it poses uh, going forward. So I'm looking forward to his remarks. Next, I want to talk about David Reeves to my right. David is one of those, what I heard referred to in court the other day as the Gitmo Bar um, by a justice in the circuit court in New York who asked the um, defense attorney if he wanted to be insulted by being called a, a, a Gitmo lawyer. It was a rather staggering moment. So this is a, um, if you wanted to be part of, considered part of the Gitmo bar. And, what did he say? Well, he, he said no, <laughs> because he was trying to argue on behalf of his client. <laughs> so, um, but anyway, um, there have been, as many of you know, dozens of lawyers who mostly doing um, volunteer work and pro bono work have represented the detainees from as early as 2004 until today. What it means to represent a detainee is quite a different profession than what it means to represent somebody in another system. And we may get to some of that today. But one of the reasons that I wanted David to come here was I, I want to focus on the relationships that some of the people have had with the detainees. And David has had a, a number of relationships with his 17 remaining uh, clients at Guantanamo. One of them was Adnan Latif, who's one of the nine detainees that has died in custody since the opening of Guantanamo Bay. I'd just like to point out that nine have died, seven have been tried. So at some point, you know, maybe we, and I'm not sure we will ever redress that, both the, the balance and those statistics. When um, Adnan Latif was found dead, assumed to be a suicide, uh, David wrote a number of things. And one of them was something I also urge you to go and find. Uh, but it was a memoir of how, of his, what he used to do when he went to visit uh, Anand Latif at Guantanamo. And David spends a lot of time at Guantanamo, not as much as Carol, but a lot of time at Guantanamo. And what he talked about that stayed in my mind was the, and David can talk about it a little bit, but, but it was the way he would touch Anand Latif when he went, just on the head, on the shoulders, and different parts of his body to just see how he was. And it wasn't just, and he conveys this as his piece physically how he was but it was also how he was. And, I, and, and this is what many of the lawyers write, have written to me about, about Guantanamo, is please tell people what it means to be in custody, not just in limbo, but not having any human contact, not being able to communicate with their families, with others, and why this has everything to do with the state that, that the detainees on the hunger strike are now in. The, the numbers on the hunger strikes, and Carol will correct me if it changes in the past five minutes, but she'll know every time it changes. Um, there are a hundred, these are government figures, there are a hundred detainees that are uh, now on a hunger strike, four are being forced fed, and um, in the hospital. Total of 20, so, and okay, so, um, so a third of them are being, got it. So a third of them are being force fed and a handful of them are being force fed in the hospital. And that number changes from like four to five, how many are in the hospital. And I, I don't even know if it's the same people. Each time it's different, right? It changes. Um, some of the lawyers have much higher statistics on who's um, on the hunger strike. But I think the, the numbers themselves speak to the magnitude of it. The last panelist that I want to um, uh, 
inter introduce is Carol Rosenberg. I actually can't believe we haven't had you at the center before, but the reason is not my fault. <laughs> it's because she always she goes to Guantanamo all the time, which is in the other direction in every way. Um, so let me, if, if we gave awards at the Center on National Security, which we don't, but I would like to, we would give our first award to Carol. Um, her coverage of Guantanamo is literally the only reason we know about Guantanamo from its opening day until now. She has stayed in there despite the fact that they've insulted her, that they've asked her to leave, that they've forced her to leave, that they've banned her from coming, that they don't like her, but they've grown to like you a little more over time, at least that's what they tell me. But there have been times, and I'm not going to go into detail, where it would have, I think, been better for Carol's state of mind to, to take a break. And she hasn't. And as a result, she will be the one person who will have been at Guantanamo from the beginning to the, dare I say, end, which, um, which we're going to talk about in a little while. And so you want to read her. She's in the Miami Herald, part of the McClatchy Group. Um, and if you get the morning brief, she's on the morning brief several times a week. Um, and so we want to welcome her. So I thought we would start with an overview of what Guantanamo has looked like, focusing, of course, on the present, but giving us a little bit of perspective um, from the point of view of a lawyer who's been involved for many years. And so I thought we would start with Dave. Hello. Thank you for having me. Um, I never thought I'd be uh, in 2013, which is about a decade after I started. And I never even expected to start. Uh, when the Supreme Court in 2004 said that the detainees could go into court and seek relief uh, under the habeas corpus statutes, one of my younger colleagues uh, called and said, well, you know, I'd like to work on this. Uh, there are a number of detainees that the Center for Constitutional Rights will assign to us. Uh, we approve. And I said, yes, I'll approve, but I'm extremely busy, and I don't want to have to do any work on this. <laughs> and uh, in 2008, I left to do this work full time. I was discouraged from speaking too close to my uh, In December or November 2004, I went down to Montano for the first time. It was an overwhelming experience. Interesting, appalling, just mind blowing. When I got back, and when uh, my young colleague got back from his visit, we each slept for two days straight because of the emotional power of it. These men had never seen civilian lawyers, uh, never didn't have any idea what we were planning to do. Thought we were interrogators as a matter of fact. But they told us their stories. I started out in order to gain their trust by asking them what happened after you were captured, not what did you do, because they've been asked that about 10,000 times. And we heard the awful stories from the time they were picked up up to the present time of Guantanamo. And they also told us their stories about uh, what had happened uh, before they were captured. The interesting thing, I guess from an outsider's perspective, is that we, their lawyers, are the only <coughs> civilians who are allowed to see them. I'm putting aside the Red Cross because they don't get to talk about it. About it. No member of the public can just waltz in. You have to have a security clearance, for example. I think that's the key. Uh, without that, you're nowhere. They don't let reporters talk to the detainees. They don't let politicians talk to detainees. It's very hard to get an independent medical expert down there to talk to detainees. So the long and the short of it is we're really the link between the detainees and the world at large. What we're up against, what we've always been up against, is the myth propagated by the Bush administration that these are the worst of the worst. Uh, uh, Joint Chief of Staff Meyer once said that these detainees would chew their way through a, an electric cord if necessary to bring down a tank. 
And the American people were absolutely and irrevocably poisoned by this. The American people <coughs> continue to think of the detainees as interchangeable, as fungible, and have no idea that these are real human beings. These are individuals. They're as unique, each one of them, as you are, as I am, as anyone is. They have families, they have jobs. I don't need to go into more detail. The point is clear. But the American people don't know them. They don't know who they are. We're the only ones who do. And we've not only been meeting with them for 10 years, but we've gone to their home countries and met with their families, know their families too. So one of the great things we're up against, and we have been up against, is the preconception of who we were representing. But getting to Karen's point, what really drew me in to the work and consumed me was the, uh, were the men themselves. Not that they had a great case, although all of my clients have a great case, um, but that they were these individuals who were such in, hor in such horrible positions. And they were, I mean, I say it again, unique people. They were people, not symbols, which is the way most people think of them. And without going into detail about each one, although I will mention one or two, that's what drew me in. I visited Yemen in the spring of 2005, which is where most of my, all of my clients at the time lived, met the families, got a sense of the politics of the country. Uh, my clients over the years have consisted of a Pakistani businessman who uh, sort of brokered uh, 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 fabric sales between Pakistan and Walmart or Kmart. He was lured to Thailand where he was kidnapped by the CIA. His son is in prison on terrorism related charges, which basically boil down to immigration fraud. And another client of mine was a big wheel in Sana, very prominent businessman. He was lured to Egypt under the pretense of a business deal. He too was kidnapped in um, Cairo. Yet another detainee uh, was an aid worker stationed in Karachi. He was helping an agency of charity that was determined to be a terrorist organization. So he too was sent to Guantanamo. One of the most uh, outrageous, I mean, they're all outrageous, but think about this one. A client from the south of Yemen, which is the poor uh, half of Yemen and sort of oppressed by the north, wanted to emigrate to the west in order to find economic freedom, I mean, economic opportunity, religious tolerance. He was pretty secular. He ultimately was kidnapped in a Tehran and brought to Guantanamo. I can give you the background on that, but this is a guy who was looking for freedom. And, and Western culture. David, can I, I just want to ask you one question? As the panel is not the same, no, no, no. As the panel is not as um, all partisan as we often do, this is our rarity for us. So I'm going to play devil advocate a little bit here, just to ask you one question, which, which is that I'm not. Sure, I'm just curious of your reflections on this. Actually, is that. Yes, there is a sense that well, everybody at Guantanamo is guilty, and we know now from George Bush, his administration, releasing nearly 500, that there have been many who are not, they couldn't associate it with anything um, related to terrorism. So I want to just distinguish between a couple of things. There are individuals at Guantanamo who may be guilty of things that they can be charged with. There are a number of individuals at Guantanamo who are from Yemen, as are many of your clients who cannot be returned, even if they've been cleared for release, and we have a number of those. But, but, but I, I just want you to distinguish between the idea that they shouldn't be treated this way because they're not guilty, and they shouldn't be treated this way whether they're guilty or not guilty. And I just, can you just talk about yes. that a little bit? Uh, there are individuals there who, according to the United States government, 
committed crimes directly against the United States. The 9-11 defendants who are currently being tried. Uh, the alleged mastermind of the cold bombing. Carol probably knows more about the individuals and the charges that I do, than I do, but these are people who are being tried for allegedly committing crimes against the United States. The mass of detainees, the rest of the detainees, other than this group of uh, what we'll call military commission targets, uh, haven't been charged with anything. They've, been, they've spent 10 years of their lives, or 11 years of their lives, not charged with anything, and having no idea when this is going to end. No end in sight. Uh, Karen said, um, you know, the, the great number of detainees aren't guilty. I always respond to that by saying, guilty of what? They're not charged with anything. What's the crime? They're basically guilty uh, because the United States thinks that they are bad people. It will say that they're part of Al-Qaeda or part of the Taliban. But at the end of the day, it reduces to the fact that the United States thinks these are bad people, pose some kind of diffuse, undefined danger to the United States. And that's why they've held all these years. As for the 500 that the Bush administration released, not really because the Bush administration thought that these were uh, safe guys to release, it's because its policy of release was diplomatic. The Europeans went, the Saudis went, the Afghans went, the Pakistanis went, the Australian went, the Canadian went. Who doesn't go? Yemen. Uh, and other countries that uh, the United States doesn't have a very good or solid relationship with. So the Bush administration's approach was rather diplomatic whereas Obama's approach is more uh, judicial, if you will, one by one by one. So I want to try to get ahead quickly. The uh, relationships that I developed with the individuals became very powerful, overwhelming, consuming. And I, I just made many trips to Guantanamo. Um, and these trips were not three-day trips because I represented over a dozen detainees. <laughs> I developed a very special relationship with the authorities down there too. Perhaps not as not as remarkable as Carol's, but nevertheless. Uh, and so that that's really the the problem that the American people don't see these men as individuals, don't understand the unfairness and injustice of keeping them there without charging the men with anything, uh, and with no end in sight. So. We went through our court proceedings, the detainees, in an attempt to get the judge to say the U.S. wasn't lawfully holding them. The detainees won more than half the cases. You can dispute what the exact number is, but they won more than half the cases in the district court. Well, the Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia Circuit reversed all of their wins and affirmed all of their losses. It was the opinion of the reactionary Court, that the courts just had no business in this, and the courts essentially withdrew from the Guantanamo problem. So they didn't hear any of the cases either. And so we were without the courts. Congress uh, turned this into a political football. And that brings me to a side note that Obama himself is more responsible for the fact that Guantanamo is still open than anyone else came into office making Guantanamo signature issue. <coughs> to be fair, Bush had called for Guantanamo to be closed. McCain had called for Obama to be closed, uh, for Obama, for <laughs> Guantanamo to be closed all across the spectrum. And I think that Obama thought, hey, you know, this is, this is, a, this is a free pass. Uh, this will be uncontroversial and it will give me a lot of credit. But the Republicans immediately turned the issue against him. Uh, are you for terrorism? Are you against terrorism? Guantanamo became a proxy for that. And the men really fell out of the equation here. Guantanamo was simply a, uh, a litmus test for or against. Uh, and Obama himself set up a very arduous and uh, bureaucratic process for reviewing the individual detainees. 
that stretched out the theory for the Republicans to jump on him if he had simply acted very quickly in releasing the detainees. Uh, I think that most, most of this problem would be uh, solved. Fast forward, Obama was trying to do the right thing when he said that the 9-11 defendants would be tried in federal court in New York. Controversy, he moves them to military commissions. He wants to bring detainees, Uyghurs, to the United States who have a, have, a, have a community to welcome them. There's controversy, no Uyghurs in the United States. He has shown a complete lack of leadership and political courage when it comes to Guantanamo. As time has gone on, the situation has gotten better as far as the men's living conditions. And this is the one thing where I think Obama really deserves a lot of credit. After he took office, he sent an admiral named Admiral Walsh down to Guantanamo in 2009 to determine whether or not uh, the conditions there violated, uh, complied with the Geneva Conventions, specifically Common Article 3, which is a baseline for humane treatment of prisoners. And uh, as you might expect, Admiral Walsh came back and said, oh yes, everything is in compliance, nobody's breaking the law, everything is hunky dory but I have some recommendations. And one of the main recommendations was that men uh, be allowed to live communally and not locked up in uh, single room cells. We call them isolation cells uh, or solitary confinement. The military has a euphemism for them, which I can't remember. Uh, and that began, that the move to communal living began a general improvement in the conditions of confinement for the men. Courses were offered, uh, EBDs, books. I think the, the rec time, the prison administration allowed the men more personal freedom than ever. And the place was pretty quiet from 2009 to 2012. Yes, there were some really ugly incidents, like the death of three detainees in 2009. That was the source of a lot of controversy. I will be the first to say that there were these uh, ugly incidents. But overall, especially as we moved into 2011, 2012, I think that it was quite tranquil and a client I met just last week made the same point. When I went to client meetings, we had less and less to talk about. They had no substantial complaints, at least from an outsider's standpoint. And they had access to media that told them about just about everything about the world. They had Al Jazeera English, they had Arabic channels, they were getting the New York Times and so forth. We, we were sort of, you know, like after 15 or 20 minutes, we were hard pressed unless I brought them a Subway sandwich or a McDonald's hamburger to keep going. Then, and I know Carol fundamentally disagrees with me on this, in the summer of 2012, the uh, responsibility for handling detention operations shifted uh, uh, from, uh, from a commander named Donnie Thomas to a commander named John Ogden. Now, uh, Thomas wasn't all sweetness and light, although I think that his, his uh, strictness really fell on the lawyers more than on the Canadians. But Ogden came in and threw overboard the enlightened, what I would call the enlightened uh, approach to detention of his predecessors and decided to crack the whip, show who was boss, rule with an iron fist, display power, and generally be a hard ass uh, as far as the detainees were concerned. In September, there were two main camps, Camp 5 and Camp 6. Camp 6 was the uh, communal one at most of the men, Camp 5 mainly isolation cells. Anyhow, stormed Camp 6, had the guard stormed Camp 6, including communal areas which had never been invaded before, surrounded the uh, camp with Hummers, armed Hummers. And there was no provocation for it. It appeared to be simply a demonstration of power for power's own sake. 
At the same time, my poor client, Adnan Latif, died, and I can attribute his death, at least in part, to the inflexibility and, and rigidity of the command in, in dealing with this individual. In January, a tower guard fired on a group of detainees in a rec yard who had been there playing soccer uh, over a dispute started by another detainee's attempt to enter the area. The uh, tower guard, the tower guard uh, fired and, and uh, some were hit and one was wounded. And then, of course, you have the hunger strike. The, the immediate precipitating factor was the resumption of correct of Quran searches. Uh, it's not just the text in Islam, as far as I understand it, is holy. The book itself is holy, which I think is different from many other religions. These men just could not bear uh, uh, the Quran searches again. So they went on hunger strike. Bogdan unlike his predecessors, was unwilling to sit down and talk with them about it. He wouldn't talk with them about it unless they broke their hunger strike, and they wouldn't break their hunger strike unless he talked with them about it. So it was sort of a stalemate. But because it was a stalemate, it dragged on and on and on and on. The demands broadened to in basically be a protest against the indefinite detention, and now the men are going into their fourth month. Some have lost as much as 60 pounds, a number are being uh, force fed, and since I'm running out of time, I will just say that it's a miserable situation, and I don't see the end of it. Uh, so this is a good segue to Dr. Thompson. Um, talk a little bit about, I'd like you to talk a little bit about your getting involved in the Constitution uh, Report project, because unlike David and Carol, you're sort of a newcomer to the Guantanamo conversation. And so therefore, the perspective of somebody who comes onto this as somebody with just fresh eyes is, is very informative for the rest of us in terms of how to reach a broader public and tell a story that will have broader um, echoing. So could you just talk a little bit about getting the, the project itself and what you found out? Sure. I am a relative newcomer. But there's a thread that goes back, and a reason for my involvement. I've always been concerned about standards of medical practice, deeply concerned about injustice and human rights. And 10 years as chair of a board at Columbia University on the professionalism aspects of medicine, and many years on the board of physicians for human rights. So I did have a background of concern and the major reason I got involved in the Constitution project was because I was invited. I may have been the only physician, uh, physician with these interests to who they could find, and I was the only physician uh, among the members of that Constitution project task force. I am uh, very impressed and deeply honored to be sitting here with these champions uh, for such a long period of time addressing this episode uh, or atrocity at Guantanamo Bay, which will go down in our history as a terrible stain on the way this country has treated detainees, has conducted itself in manipulation of all kinds of uh, rules and regulations that and engaged in terrible mistreatment that we always looked overseas to judge. But here we find it on our shores. There's no question that everyone, uh, public, no question, the White House, our legislators have gone to sleep on Guantanamo Bay. They've forgotten about it. They wrote it off. The lights have been turned on. There was no more coercive interrogation, so forth. So the reason that we are here talking about it now, the reason that it's been put back in the face of the public, is because the detainees are demonstrating. And they're demonstrating basically the cause of indefinite detention. We've heard details from David Brink about the ignition of this protest. But make no mistake, 
the underlying problem here is indefinite detention, immortal detention, as the detainees see it. No hope, no way out. And the only reason we're hearing more about it, the only reason we're hearing something from the White House, is because they are protesting. And they are protesting in the only way that they possibly can. They can't march around with placards or call in people to tell them what's going on. They're protesting with their bodies, a threat to their lives by engaging in a hunger strike. It's a long history of hunger strikes around the world. The most pointed was the suffragettes in England who engaged in a hunger strike for the right to vote, for women to vote. It's an interesting one because they, those women, were force-fed. First knowledge we had of force-feeding in the early 1900s. This hunger strike, then, is of utmost important to the importance of the They have their bodies, their lives, they're risking a lot, they're on the line. It's obviously of great importance to the detention center to our government. They have all of these lives to worry about, the danger to the detainees, and face it, they also have a potentially effective protest on their hands. In the last uh, several decades, Hunger strikes around the world tend to be somewhat effective. The hunger strikers get something. Now, as we monitor this and hope some way to intervene, one way or another, it's very important that we understand what the hunger strike is. And it's not, not easy to do that. There are all sorts of definitions, but the whether or not these hunger strikers are successful, by successful I mean, first and foremost, they don't die during the process. They cause some movement related to their protest. Depends on how the hunger strike is dealt with in the detention center. And the problem with being able to predict what the propensity is for danger or even death is that the, the definition of a hunger strike is it needs to be variable in the Guantanamo setting. You have on the one end of the scale of possibility a totally starving hunger striker who refuses all food, no food whatsoever, but does take in water. You have to take water if you're a hunger striker and you're not taking any food. If you do not take water, well, it, it's over, three, three to seven days usually. You will die if you don't take in water. Hunger strikers understand that because they've been counseled or because it's very clear that they want to have to have more. On another end of the scale of possibilities, you have a variety of folks who are totally fasting for several days and then perhaps they take a little food and they go back to total fasting and folks in between perhaps who may be getting some form of nutrition, but certainly not enough to sustain them in a normal way, but they're not totally bad. We just don't know how many are in each of those categories. Now, if a hunger striker is taking in fluid, if one adds a simple vitamin to that fluid, iron, simple vitamin, then you will prevent the development of very serious neurological complications that will occur in the absence of time, 40, 50, 60 days down the line, which can produce long-standing neurological death, or itself be a cause of death. Simple vitamin. And if you include just a little bit of sugar, a little bit of glucose, not a lot, not enough to provide real nutrition, just a bit, you can forestall the point at which the body begins, that, that the body has used up all fat, it begins to feed on itself. It begins to feed on its own muscle tissue, including the heart muscle, to get enough caloric sustenance just to keep the minimal core body functions going. And if you give a little bit of glucose in that water, you can prolong the time by weeks, 
sometimes months before you get to the point where one third of the body's muscle mass is gone, and that's the point at which hunger strikes in the past. So the importance of a hunger striker, understanding this at the very beginning, is clear. We should recognize very clearly that hunger strikers are not suicidal. They don't want to die. Unlike what we're told by the Department of Health, they do not want to die. That's contrary to their primary purpose, which is the protest. Purpose is the protest. Get the information out there, get support from the public, get support from outside of the animal bay. If they die in the week, they fail and they're dead. They want to prolong the hunger strike. And they can do that if they are properly counseled by a physician. The physician's counseling on that is not only limited to that, the proper conduct of a physician taking care of a hunger strike is well laid out in the United States medical literature, by the World Medical Association, physicians and the medical profession know what should be done to care for a hunger striker, what is proper and what is improper. What the physician, physician now, not any other medical person now, should be doing is seeing the hunger striker first. By the way, determine if it's a hunger strike, if it is a hunger strike, is this hunger striker mentally competent? Very important. Are they mentally competent so that they know what they're doing and they know what to expect? And third, very important, is this a suicidal person? If this is a person bent on suicide from the very beginning, they are not a hunger striker. They should be taken out of the hunger strike protocol and treated as a suicide. Now those determinations, not only done at the beginning, but they should be done ideally every day. And not by the medical person du jour, but by the same physician seeing the same hunger striker every day. Continuity of care. So that the hunger striker gets the sense that this physician is interested first and foremost in their welfare and is not acting as an agent or the attention center of attention. So, now, all of that, of course, is obviated by the policy of force feeding. A very different approach. The physician is not guiding or caring for the hunger strike, but the facility or some authority has decided that at some point during the hunger strike, Feeding will be done, and it will be enteral feeding, that is, food will be somehow inserted into the gastrointestinal tract. Now that, by protocol in the past, that has been done even before a physician would agree that it's necessary. It's done at the point where the hunger striker is in good enough physical shape, even though they've been, uh, even though they've been fasting, so that they can physically resist. So the process of force feeding then has become a great, a great concern, not only in like, Guantanamo Bay, but international. And what's done is that liquid food has gotten in to the hunger striker's stomach. And this is done by passing a nasogastric tube through the nose, down the esophagus, into Stomach. You have to know how to do it, or you may put it into the lung, which has happened in some instances in the past, not at one time. Because allegedly the hunger striker would resist this, the hunger striker is restrained. And it's done by putting the hunger striker in a specially made chair, a restraint chair, and the arms are restrained. The legs are restrained. The body is restrained, and the head is restrained, so that the hunger striker cannot move at all. And the only resistance the hunger striker has to pass the tube is to sort of gag and use the throat must. It's very painful, uncomfortable, traumatic. The act of restraint is assaultive. 
so this is what force feeding usually means. You do have some variations on that. You can have the nasogastric tube inserted, and the hunger striker might say, I don't want that, but I'm not going to physically resist. And maybe the food can be given, even though the hunger striker is not consented to it, but can be given without the use of such violent physical force. We don't know, we do know that restraint chairs have been used in the past, the 205 hunger strikes for sure. Uh, we don't know to what extent those who are getting nasal gas feeding now are having it done in the restraint chair. So the expectations then for the risk to the detainees, the expectations for the duration, frankly, of the hunger strike. The impact on public opinion, the impact on our elected officials in Washington. We're not sure because we don't know some of the details about the hunger strike. I would say this about this particular hunger strike. I don't know whether this is valid, but I certainly would like to hear David and uh, Farrell on this. I think this hunger strike is a little different, a lot different. It's my understanding that the 205 hunger strike at Guantanamo was in two phases. The first sort of stopped because the hunger strikers may have thought that the folks there were going to try to get the Geneva Convention Article 3 applied. And when that didn't happen, it was assumed the figure. And late during that hunger strike in December, they called in the Bureau of Prisons who advise using the restraint chair. Now, true, true, and related or not, 131 hunger strikers went down very quickly when the restraint chairs were put in place. And went down to three, I think, uh, a week later. Uh, so uh, there are those who feel that the brutality of the force feeding <coughs> had something to do with breaking that hunger uh, but you had to believe, at least at that time, there was more hope in the minds of those hunger strikers than they had when they started this hunger. No question that force feeding is uncalled for. It's been judged to be cruel, inhuman, and degrading treatment, and depending upon the level of brutality involved, torture. This by the World Medical Association by scholars and medical specialists in this country. So if indeed force feeding using restraints is going on now at Guantanamo Bay, there are serious, serious breaches of medical ethics going on. I don't think we know who's doing it. In the past, we've had the assumption that physicians were involved in the circuitry of making decisions on the protocol and actually involved in passing the tubes during the force feeding process. I doubt that now, since it appears that the contingent uh, of additional medical personnel that came in included uh, enlisted medical technicians or medics and nurses, but not a lot of doctors. And one wonders, we should know, we should know, who is doing what to the force feeding, whether they are getting the continuity of care that I've described, which is <clears throat> keeping with international and U.S. medical standards of care. I do think there's a lack of hope now, which is very dangerous, and I am afraid and wonder whether we might not have suicidal people at the beginning of hunger strike. But I, I just hope we don't get hunger strikers morphing into martyrs this thing continues and there's no response. One last thing I would say, uh, offer. I think we need to have uh, frank transparency about this hunger strike and what's going on now at one time. We had uh, between 2001 and early 2005 a time of secrecy. None of us knew what was going on. Some terrible, terrible things happened. Yeah. Tension torture, interrogation, whatever. 
in the Middle East and at Guantanamo. We didn't know that until it was over. This is different. The lights are on down there. They should be. There's no national security reason for not knowing what's going on with these hunger strikes. The lights are on, but the door's not open. We don't know. Uh, we can't fully explain these numbers and who's getting what treatment and exactly what's going on. I think we need to have a call here for transparency, not only so that we can know what's going on with these hunger strikers, but also if they are doing force feeding, they are doing that in Macy's window, they are engaged in unethical medical practices, in proper medical practices. We ought to know that. We should not have the comfort, luxury of saying, well, we didn't know. We should know. I think the demand for transparency is quite important. Thank you. A couple of, of notes. Um, one of, that David passed me, one of them is just a correction to what he said, which is that the controversial three deaths were in 2006, not 2009. The other thing is in, in reaction, I'm speaking for you just to speed things up here, is, is this distinction between being suicidal and being willing to die. Dr. Thompson referred to. It's, it's, it's about a willingness to die, to die as opposed to a um, sorry, purposeful desire to die rather separate from a protest. And I think it's because a lot of times when we're asked to speak about this, this is one of the questions we get caught up on. So just that clarification. Carol, um, as, as Dr. Thompson said, we've had a series of protests at Guantanamo, many of them starting with the abuse of the Quran, um, from the, the earliest one in, in January and February of 2002, what was over the Quran and how it was treated. Again, we see the same pattern now, um, all these years later. So, what I, and, and then the big Congress strike in 2005. But there's been a number of variants of these protest hunger strikes. Can you put this one in perspective and talk a little bit about, and, and I read this very personally to you. When this hunger strike happened, Given the fact that 86 detainees have been released, have been cleared for release, but have no sign of being released, and are sort of in, in indefinite detention, in addition to the 50 odd who are been um, designated to be in indefinite detention, how do you see this happening? What do you think it means, and how do you put it in context? So. If the goal of the hunger strike was to get attention, it seems to have worked. Um, and for the first time, I don't know in how long I'm able to say every day there's 86 people down there who third for release by the Obama administration, which seems to come as a shock every time you bring it up. Um, so of the 166 men down there, the Obama administration decided in 2009, late 2009, that 86 of them really should not be there. It doesn't mean they were, as my editor wanted to insert at one, at one point, not dangerous to anyone. And it doesn't mean that they aren't angry at us. We've held it for a dozen years. But that a conclusion was made about, I'm coming back to it, okay. A conclusion was made in, in, in in, in January 2010 that 86 people should really not be there. So now we have 100 of 166 people on hunger strike. And although it's hard to know exactly who is being force fed among the 27 who get these tubes, got these tubes today, we do know that at least some of them would not be there today if the decisions of the task force back in 2000 and late 2009 early 2010 were acted upon. So we find ourselves in this very strange position of people wanting attention and getting it, and there, there being a combination of people, none of them are convicts, by the way. I know that from my reporting. None of them are awaiting trial. I know that from my reporting. I have heard that some of the people awaiting these death penalty trials are doing solidarity fasts, but they're not hunger strike. By any, now, one of the issues we have here is there's different versions of, of what's going on down there. So what I'm doing is synthesizing. I can tell you that they're not 
the people who are um, facing the death penalty trials, not because the military says it, but because the military says it and their lawyers say it. The job of the journalist in this thing is to figure out, is not to puppet what either side says, but to figure out what I can tell you to be true based on vectors, triangulation. So anyways, we're, there are 100 men down there on a hunger strike. 27 as of today are on these tubes or in the hospital. Some of them were cleared for relief. If the goal of the hunger strike was to get attention, they got it. And it's not such a simple thing because, as Karen said, I've covered these hunger strikes since the very first one, and the, polit the practice of the military has been to omit it, to deny it, to suggest that if people don't report it, People will start eating and they will not be put at health risk, and then ultimately to acknowledge it. So where we are today is they're acknowledging it, and they're acknowledging it in a systematic way where we get, I can, I can call up one time and get a number every day. People will dispute the numbers, but the numbers give you a snapshot and an understanding that there is a crisis going on right now. That twice a day, up to twice a day, 27 men are taken from their cells, put in these feeding chairs, and they get a can of Ensure. Pump through a nasogastric <coughs> tube. It goes, I, I've never seen this. A, a, a couple of previous, I've never spoken to a detainee at Guantanamo. They've called me and emailed me after they've left. But I've never spoken to anybody in detention spoken to people afterwards, which is very interesting. Um, I call up and say thank you for writing about me. Um, I've never seen a forced feeding. I was offered for a considerable period of time, um, I think in 06, 07, to have it done to me. Mm -hmm. the, way you're, the way you're a reporter at Guantanamo is you go and you look. You get taken through stations of the detention center and you get to see the things that David doesn't get to see. He gets taken to one location and meets his, his client in a lockup while the reporters are going on the stations of the tour. Um, so one of the things you do is you go to the hospital where no defense lawyer has ever been able to meet their client as far as I know. And you don't get to gawk at the prisoners, but you're in the same vicinity. And they take you to a display, which you can see on my website, which has the feeding chair and has the preparation for the feed. And for many trips, they would say, Carol, would you like us to do it to you? It's not painful at all. So it's, in, you know, you're a journalist. It's kind of an interesting. It's, it's not an interesting, it's an uncomfortable position to be put in. Uh, and so you do the journalism thing. You try to figure out, well, what's the value of this? If I sit down in this chair, and I agree to have it done to me, and it's not particularly painful, it's meaningless, because I've complied. I've agreed. This is my, my choice. I mean, it, I'm not the person who said, I don't want to be fed, and I'm not the person who's taken in shackles from my, my cell. I've, I've, I've agreed to this exercise. The bottom line is, at the end of the day, I concluded that there was no useful article I could write about it except end up writing about I experienced it, which is not why I go there. So, they, okay, so I got lost a little bit. Um, let me, I want to follow up with something. I have a million questions for you, so no, no problems. I want to follow up on something David brought up about the difference in the commands. Because there have been a number of different kinds of commanders, both the, you know, the, the ones who want to brand themselves as humanitarian types and the ones who want to brand themselves as, as hard asses. You know? And so do you think that the change in command mattered here, or do you think that, that the indefinite detention was enough or, or how do you actually or do you think that it's that the combination of a more lenient one followed by a harsher one how exactly do you see the command itself playing into this the, the, the dispute that David and I have is over this choice of 
of blaming Colonel Bob Edwards. I'm not saying that he isn't to blame. I'm saying it's the only, he's the only senior officer down there who's in the prison whose name we know, so it seems to be that that would be the person to blame. What we know is a number of things have changed down there. And what we know is that there are now a, there's now a more professional guard force of military police, many of whom did come back from theater in Afghanistan and Iraq, who are now guarding in the communal camp, a camp where prisoners lived inside an enclosure in what is generously called, a, I call a dormitory style situation. They could walk in and out of their cells. They could eat together, pray together, walk outside into an enclosure and kick a soccer ball around. And the guard force there had been sailors who were generally had never been in the battlefield, who were brought out, out of off of ships and, and and single assignments, and given the role of managing that prison. And so they had, I believe, and I think we agree on this, a different doctrine of the relationship. The, the, and I will tell you that I was there in Ramadan, and there was a soldier who was in charge of it, who was an officer, who was an army captain, who said to me, he looks in the enclosure and he knows that some of those guys could have been gone long ago. So it's a matter of maintaining the relationship and managing. So what we know now is yes, Colonel Bogdan is in charge, and yes, the relationship is, is, has not been managed in the same way. I will, I will say that, Karen and I have talked about this, the first hunger strike began very early on in, in March of 2002, and it began, and, and it's illustrative and it's important, um, it began when a National Guardsman from a flyover state that I can't remember, like Iowa, looked into a cage and saw a detainee who turned his towel into a turban and was praying. And the protocols at the time, and the SOPs at the time said, you can only use your towel as a towel. And he went to the cage and he said, take that off your head. And the, and the prisoner ignored him and he was praying. And he yelled at him to take the towel, towel, turban off his head. And um, I'm telling you the story because I was told it both by a spokesman at the time and subsequently we heard it via people who spoke to detainees. And, the guard was so enraged, he stormed inside that cage, took the turban off the head, and as the Marine Major told me at the time, wincing, his foot came in contact with the Koran. I'm like, he kicked the Koran? He's like, well, something happened and everybody went on a hunger strike. And what we know is religious tension it seems to have sparked many of these. And, and, and what's important about that episode, which in contrast to today is, it went on, first of all, they omitted it. They didn't tell us for a number of cycles that they were refusing to eat. Then they sort of begrudgingly acknowledged it. And then they got into the rhythm of what we have today, which is a toll of how many people were refusing to eat. And the military is very good at keeping numbers. So the 100 refused lunch, 130 refused dinner. 180 refused breakfast, and they would statistically prove what they didn't want us to know, and so we could write about it in detail. And the way that strike ended was, the general in charge of the prison at the time was sitting in his office and understood that he runs the camp. That if they're not eating, and they are, in, they are creating this crisis, he can't manage the camp. They're creating, they're, it's, they're causing the circumstances. It's a, it's a management problem. So he got in his Jeep and he drove down there and he got the translator and he got on the PA and he said, wear your towels as turbans. Fine. But you have to understand that if, I, if my soldier says, take the turban off so we can look inside it to see if there's a ship, you have to agree to let us look inside your turban towel. They turned their towels into turbans that night and they ate breakfast the next day and it ended. And I know this story in part because the general told me he got hate mail. It's probably too strong. But people said to him, you're coddling the prisoners. And his position was, I have to manage people in cages. I have to manage prisoners in cells. And I figured, a, a, I found a solution so that the management worked. And what we do have with Colonel Bogdan right now and what we do have with Admiral Smith right now, and what we do have with General Kelly, who's the four-star running Southcom right now, is 
nobody seems to be trying to figure out how to find that symbolic, insignificant something to give the prisoners who might want to stop hunger striking the ability to claim victory. Yeah, I, I want to just interject here a little bit because I wrote at length about that, and I, and um, what was interesting was that he started with that term towels and determines, but he also, following Obama's one person at a time policy, went and actually met with some of the more hardcore people and found out what they wanted. Sometimes the general in charge of the prison. Right, general, in yes, with general letter and. Well, what the, the part of this I wanted to tell is that as much as I admire this general, as much as I thought it was a good story, I didn't believe it because it was too it was too pretty. The towels and determined well, the whole thing about how he handled it and how the military is back. So I went and found the detainees that had been released that had witnessed it and talked to them, and it was positive they were going to say that's you know there was no kindness or compassion or meeting of the minds or anything or symbolic in the victory. Or symbol and they told me exactly the same story that, that you've told, that the general told me, that others have told me. And so there can be a shared narrative. And there wasn't a shared narrative on so much of this other stuff. So I just wanted to um, But the point being, we have a crisis right now, and I can't find the thing that's going to change, help stop what for me is getting up every morning and finding how many people are in the hospital, how many people are being too fed. That's, not, and your, I, that's and not your job. No, but I'd like to be able to report it. Um, <laughs> right, but but then I just want to talk about the 2005 hunger strike, which is important. Three, three data points. One is I remember the feeding chair and talking to the general in charge of South Prom at the time and saying it sounds really, really awful. And he said, well, Carol, mm -hmm. No, this is a Okay, this is itself. Okay, go ahead. Bands Craddock. I believe it was it was General Craddock. We'd have to do the timeline. And and, and the answer was, but Carol, they were they were spitting up the food. They were figuring out how to vomit up the food. And so we needed to stabilize them so they would take the nutrition. And what that says to me is the entire narrative can be true, and what they think is, is a logical solution, someone else sees as a cruel solution. And, and how do you answer that? They, they have decided, you have a whole debate about this, and they do, you will, whether or not they should be force-fed. <coughs> They have decided, this government has decided that they will not let them starve at Guantanamo Bay. That they have decided that they're going to force feed them. I can tell you all the different reasons why they say it, I've written about it. But they, they, they made this decision. So in 2005, yes, the chair may have broken the strike, but the major difference between then and now is that in 2005, prisoners were leaving. They were being repatriated. It wasn't, it wasn't that nobody, it wasn't that the last person that everybody knew left was Adnan Latif who went home dead. They were leaving and the Bush administration was sending them. And that there was the possibility that you could leave Vietnam. And if you talk to people down there who actually think about this issue, they really believe that one, two, three of these transfers, of these people, hopefully, presumably, who are among the 86 who are theoretically good to go, if they let a couple of them go, this crisis, I'm not saying that, you know, everybody's going to go back to communal and they're going to be, I'm hoping that some of them are going to be eating communally this Ramadan. They were eating communally last Ramadan. But, but that something, it, it feels to me as the reporter who's done this, like something has to happen to change. If the military can't think of anything and the president can't figure out how to get out of there the people he said could go. Something has to happen. I think it's easy. Okay. Uh, go for it, David. The um, hunger strike was begun because of the search of the Korans. The men say either stop searching the Korans or 
let us turn our Qurans into you permanently, full time, and that way we know they won't be searched. Ogden refuses even to discuss the issue. I think that the men would be encouraged if uh, the government started transferring some detainees, but I don't think that that by itself would end the hunger strike because you still have this very, very basic problem with the grand surges. On the other hand, I think that many men would stop their hunger strike if either they stopped searching the Koran or they allowed the detainees to hand them in. And that can't happen if the, if the administration is unwilling even to talk to the detainees. So that's one point I'd make. That's I also a symbolic want, gesture that David was. Let them all turn in the Korans, not have Korans. Or don't search them. And in that connection, I'd like to make a point that really didn't hit me until last week. There were hundreds or thousands of books in the Guantanamo detainee library. There are libraries in each cell block, where Carol can give you the numbers of the cell blocks or the numbers of the books. Which book is searched? The Koran. What about all those other books? And if the detainees think that the Koran's going to be searched, they just hide their shivs and their AK-47s and <laughs> apples and stuff like that in Harry Potter. Those books are not searched. Searching the Koran is a provocation. It is a conscious provocation. It's a deliberate provocation. And here's how the detainees responded. Uh, we're hearing from folks who are deeply embedded in this situation, they're on the ground. And I have to say, they're not from a distance, that's a problem. That there is a belief that a local policy change could stop this hunger strike. I had a sense that a, a behind-the-scenes power behind this hunger strike was the loss of hope the prospect of indefinite detention. They saw nothing happening, nobody moving, no change in policy, and even those who had been freed to leave were still there. Now, I just, the question I have is, uh, can you attach a relative comparative power to indefinite detention as compared to these local factors which might be corrected by local policy? Do you really think that the hunger strike would end if we change the policies that ignited it on the ground at Guantanamo Bay without having any potential for ending in that end. One sentence, the hunger strike won't end. Somebody's been on a hunger strike since 2005 there. The question is, does it have to be 100 of the 160? In my I think Carol's right. I do think that uh, if the administration of Guantanamo said, okay, we'll either let you do A or B with the Koran, a lot of men would stop hunger striking. Even if the hunger strike ended entirely because of these local changes, what the hunger strike has succeeded in doing, as Carol said, is getting attention. People forgot about Guantanamo after President Obama took office. He said, I'm gonna close Guantanamo. Everybody thought he had closed Guantanamo. And the hunger strike reminds people that Guantanamo is still open for business. It's refocused everybody on this. It's become a national issue again. And I think that's going to pressure uh, politicians uh, and other opinion makers to really try to accomplish something this time. And I just want to say one thing. I, I've sort of had a guiding principle since the first 20 men arrived there, which is they're not all one thing. They're on, you may be, dress them all alike, and you may keep them all under the same conditions, and. They, they may have at one point described them all as the worst of the worst, but what we've learned in 12 years is that these are really a range of extremely different men who have different attitudes, who suddenly are doing, the, 100 of them are doing the same thing at one time, but I don't believe that 100 of them have to be doing the same thing at one time. They come from different countries, they come from different cultures, they have different attitudes towards their detention. I mean, I, I we, we, even if we don't like what we read on WikiLeaks from the military intelligence assessments, even the most you know, milita military interpretation of who they are makes it clear 
that there are a very different range of people who are who have all made the same choice, and I assume some of them would make different choices. I mean, this is my thing. If presented with some sort of a <laughs> symbolic gesture. We're gonna take one more comment and then open it up for questions, and um, so get your questions ready. I just want to make sure I call attention to the Constitution Project's board on detainee treatment. Almost 600 pages. It is a tremendous educational document and an outstanding reference document to any interested in what we're talking about here. I also want to call attention to the fact that we have one of the superb investigative attorneys who did a lot of the work digging all this stuff up, interviewing people here with us. And that's Catherine Walker, please. She has become a major resource on all of this. Uh, we all owe her a great deal. Um, so your questions, and if you don't have any, I of course have more. So we'll start over there. Wait for the microphone, and please be aware that this is being taped, so identify yourself and, and know that there will be a record. <laughs> Thank you. I'm Bob Perps. I'm a civil rights lawyer in New York. <clears throat> I'd like to uh, know why it is that 86 people uh, that Obama says should be released are not being released. What are the obstacles in Yemen and elsewhere? Why can't Obama find a place to release them? Well, the one thing Obama said he would not send detainees back to Yemen, and detainee Yemenis constitute 56 of the 86 who are cleared for release, so that leaves you with 30 others. It's uncertain how much progress Ambassador Dan Freed made in making arrangements for the other 30. Half of them, I understand, it's a question of just sending them home. The other half, it's a question of resettling other countries. But the main point is that until President Obama lifts this moratorium on transfers to Yemen, there is no hope. He's not going to find countries to take 56 Yemenis. He can hardly find countries to take, to take um, Canadians. Other, to take Uyghurs, perfect example. Uh, so um, we have this problem, and recently officials have said, we don't see Obama lifting this moratorium for the foreseeable future. You talk about the waiver? That was my next point. Um, now there is a way that President Obama can transfer detainees if he wants to. Congress passed a law, the National Defense Authorization Act, which is a fiscal year budget act. So there's the 11 Act, the 12 Act, the 13 Act, the 14 Act. And Congress imposes certification requirements on the Secretary of Defense as a precondition of transferring a detainee. And the uh, certification requirements essentially require the Secretary of Defense to say, the receiving country will make sure that this guy never engages in terrorist activity. Now, of course, that's a standard that nobody make. It's, it's practically a zero risk standard. However, there is another provision, pr provision of the same law that says that the key certifications here don't have to be made or can be made on a looser standard if the secretary determines that the transfer is in the interest of, the nat of national security. To me, that gives the president all of the authority and all the flexibility he needs and the only thing that's lacking, and it's everything that's needed, is political will. The board. Aaron Gabor Rona from Human Rights First. Uh, I've been following Guantanamo since the beginning, first at the ICRC and now at Human Rights First. And I was never more optimistic about its uh, prospects for closure than um, on the day of Obama's first inauguration, which I watched from Guantanamo and sat with a number of human rights colleagues, and we all said to each other, thank God we're never going to have to come back here again. But I was never more pessimistic about its closure than last week when I talked to a Rotary Club in central Pennsylvania. And um, the overwhelming sense of the reaction and questions I got from members of the Rotary Club were exactly the point that you made, David, about um, people who were just subhuman because they would gnaw the cables off of uh, whatever it was to make the plane come down. And 
and how would you feel if you were one of the victims of the Boston you know, bombing and letting Guantanamo detainees go? Um, I think this was perhaps the most instructive lesson that I've had about Guantanamo in a long time. And I wonder how any of you who have been, and, and like me, in the mix of the policy makers, the planners, the opponents as well as, as, as the supporters, we are living in something of a rarefied atmosphere here, um, whereas it seems to me that despite the amount of attention that this is um, garnering right now, um, I'm not sure that there's any significant change in, in public opinion about who's at Guantanamo and, and what the dangers are of letting Guantanamo detainees go. Do any of you think that um, I'm misreading the American public, and do any of you think that um, what the American public generally thinks about Guantanamo isn't going to be determinative. Anybody want to take a stab at that? Generally, my readers don't care if they stop. I would say generally, my readers don't wouldn't care if they stop. This, if they start to death at Guantanamo Bay, this is not an issue that people give the kind of detailed thought about what does indefinite detention mean, what does the right to choose to starve yourself mean. It just, it seems like it's, frankly, to a lot of my readers, like it's just been around forever. I just, I just want to say something else, the question about why the 86 can't leave. The Obama strategy at the beginning was they had an ambassador who was traveling the world fashioning individual solutions for individual cases. Taking somebody who, for example, maybe couldn't go back to Yemen and, and, and getting perhaps, and it has happened, you know, Switzerland, to agree to give them a kind of an asylum resettlement package, one at a time, and they would, and, and, it, and it particularly pathetic cases at Gitmo, he would be able to, in some instances, sell. And a country would agree to take that person. Um, and it, like I said, it was almost like a refugee or asylum status. Well, and, and they made quite a bit of success on it, to my surprise. There are Guantanamo detainees resettled in countries in the, in, in the, during the Obama administration that include Switzerland, Spain, Palau, sort of settled. Um, Cape Verde, Germany, help me out here. I mean, Bulgaria. oh yeah, Bulgaria, um, as we all know, Bermuda. Um, and the two Uyghurs recently went to El Salvador. And they had quite a bit of success on this, which was quite impressive because the, the, the fear is always that this is, somebody will be released and they'll come back and become a, a terrorist nightmare. And so what they were saying is fashion an individual solution, get a country or a community to commit to them. And fundamentally what happened is Europe lost interest in this exercise because we wouldn't take any. We have people at Gitmo, you're an attorney, who are under court or three, three Uyghurs who are under court release orders, unlawful detention, habeas release orders, Judge Urbina. Yeah. And, and so they, there was a plan at one point to bring them to the States. The judge said, let them go. And the thing is, they can't go to China. And they, we don't want them in Afghanistan, and I don't think they want to be back in Afghanistan. And we wouldn't take them. So it got to the point where, if I understand correctly from people in the administration, we just couldn't find countries that were willing to do what we wouldn't do. Um, and then there's the overarching Yemen problem, which I would remind began in 2010 when Omar Farouk Abdul Muttalib was arrested with this underwear bomb thing, and it was. And while he was a Nigerian, his inspiration came from Al Qaeda of the Arabian Peninsula, which is in Yemen. And the President of the United States, not Congress, imposed a halt on transfers of Yemenis to Yemen. Carol, that's an excellent way for me to start in my comments and an answer to Gore's question. I don't think this is one of those issues where what the general public feels or thinks really matters very much. I think that this is a fight that's being fought among political elites. And I believe that President Obama really does want to close Guantanamo, that he's earnest about it. But the problem, as he sees it, is political. Now, 
President Obama imposed the ban on sending Yemenis home to Yemen because powerful senators were saying, you must do that. You must do that because the Nigerian met with Awaki. And because Awaki is in Yemen, it's unsafe to send Guantanamo detainees back to Yemen. It may sound like a complete non sequitur. It is a complete non sequitur. But Obama was afraid of the politics of the situation. Now, the key senator, Dianne Feinstein, has written President Obama a letter saying, you know, maybe it's time to reconsider this Yemen policy. And I think that what is encouraging now is that President Obama may be getting more and more political cover on Capitol Hill from great uh, newspapers and other you know, media all across the country, Miami Herald is a great example, saying it's time to do this. Enough is enough. 12 years? It's ridiculous. Mm -hmm. So I think it's the issue of political cover, and I'm hopeful that President Obama will continue to get it. Thank you. Thank you. I do think public opinion should be important. And little biopsies we get in our discussions with people may be helpful. But if the prevalent public opinion in this country is that what's going on at Guantanamo Bay is of no importance, let them die, let them stop. Even because they don't know. They don't know what we've done on behalf of national security. What they are doing on our behalf. This is not behind closed doors anymore. This is not 202 where we don't know. We can find out if we think it's important. We can find out. And if our attitude as a public, let them die, don't care about Guantanamo. So, this says something very bad about where we are. So we're famous for ending on time. So today we're going to become famous for not ending on time because we started late. So we we're going to take a couple more questions, starting with this one right here. Thank you very much. Thank you for this excellent panel. Um, my name is Stephanie Rukoff. I'm here from Rural County. And we feel that public pressure is very important in closing Guantanamo. Um, we're trying to raise money this week to put a full page in the New York Times on probably the 16th of May, right before the 100th day of the hunger strike. Um, I gave out to about two-thirds of the people here a copy of the ad and a letter explaining it. I ran out of copies, but you can go to our website, worldcantwait.net. It would be great if you would sign on to it. We need to have that public pressure to force something to happen on this in a, um, you know, in a very public way. And if you want to speak with me afterwards, I can talk to you. Okay, we have a question over here. You've shamed me because I so quickly dismissed uh, the influence of public opinion. That kind of public opinion is very supportive, but I don't see the opponents coming out with petitions, keep it open, keep it open. So I think what you're doing is great. Not yet. Not yet. Not yet. Okay. okay. Wait for the microphone. Look to your left. Uh, hi, I'm Charles Church. I am a uh, human, human rights lawyer. Uh, my question, and I don't think I've missed it, uh, is I haven't heard anybody talk about the ones who are not cleared for release or, or transfer are not part of the 9-11 or the phone crews, but who are not going to be pro not going to be prosecuted and who are not going to leave. President Obama and his task force decided. Uh, designated, defined 46 of 166 as indefinite detainees. Too dangerous to release, no, no evidence that could bring them to trial. There is a population or a category of detainee at Guantanamo as defined by the Obama administration as forever detainees in a forever war. Well, it's our Until the end of hostilities. It's our position that all of them should be released, but the ones who are cleared are the easy cases. So we'll take care of the easy cases and then move on to the more challenging cases. Right. 
Michael Marsh, uh, Dr. Thompson, uh, force feeding is a cruel process. What I don't understand, and uh, perhaps this will not be very popular to this group, why aren't they sedated? Why aren't they, you know, just given an, an, an injection, which knock them out, put them in a chair, force feed them, carry them back to their cell, and move on? I, I just don't understand why, why, the, why the, the, they, they need to, you know, do this whole inhumane process. It's a revealing question. Uh, first, if they did sedate them, of course there wouldn't be the suffering you they go through when the tube is being jammed around. Right. But, but it would still be clearly against their will. It's a human rights violation. So. On the other end of the scale of possibility of explaining, there are those who believe that the brutality of force feeding was in fact some sort of punishment or coercion to stop the force feeding and to prevent future enrollments in force feeding, which, which you wouldn't get by if they were sedated. The other thing you need to understand is that I haven't seen it. I'm just telling you what I've been told, is that the military says that not every time does someone get taken to a feeding chair and have the tube inserted? That on occasion, a um, detainee will, think about human nature, will say, okay, never mind, just give me the can of short and chug it. And I mean, I can't even imagine, it's, they're having a hard enough time managing 27 people being fed twice a day in these enteral feeds. Can you imagine if they were trying, I, I mean, medical management of, Putting, knocking people out twice a day to administer these feedings and moving them back and forth to a hospital facility. They, kept, they say they have to do it twice a day so that they can absorb the nutrition. There's going to be no... And I assume they would at first try to get them to agree to this. We're going to take one more question and it's going to be this one. Mayor Kaiser, I'm a journalist. As a follow-up to this, Dr. Thompson, do you consider force feeding torture? It is certainly cruel in human treatment, or degrading treatment. There's no question about that. If you examine what the definition of CID is. If you add total body restraint, unable to move, which is a very serious matter, restraining patients in our hospital, Training anybody forcibly is a serious, serious medical and legal issue. And if you do it with brutality, you're forced into the chair, forced to be into restraint, and then the tube is forced into you, it certainly, it certainly uh, it, it is torture. If you look at, for example, our report, our major finding in this report, the first finding of 24, is that it was torture. And we're talking about the interrogation process, all the things that went on. And there is an elegant background memorandum in the back of the report which explains how we came to the conclusion that these interrogation procedures and methods were in fact torture. It wasn't based on our sitting around table. But there's a real process for deciding why it was torture for CIP. And what's being described for force feeding certainly would qualify. If it's done brutally with the respect it qualify as torture. So I'm going to bring this to a close and I want to make a, a couple of reflections. Um, I think it's quite appropriate that we ended with a question on torture. Um, which hadn't been in my mind when thinking about this conversation. Because in the original redefinition of torture by the Bush administration, uh, the, the basic line was it had to be you know, organ failure or near death, or as some uh, commentators said, death. We are talking about organ failure in terms of the hunger strike. That is one of the things that will happen should they die. This is an appropriate ending or an appropriate symbol, whether or not we want these individuals to be seen as symbols. This is all 
the same policy that started in 2001 and that we have not recovered from. And the fact that it, it looks this way is, is appropriate. This is all the same story and it is always going to look this way until it ends. The other thing I want to say is something Ke Carol kept referring to, and I'm not sure that you absorbed what this was about. It gets to the point of transparency. We have never, from the beginning of Guantanamo, had numbers. And the Obama administration has said, we will do this on a, our policy is a one-by-one -one policy. But they still don't give us numbers. You call up and you get numbers in the morning. Well, there are 100 detainees that are on a hunger strike. But it's always, it used to be, how many, how many people are at Guantanamo? You'd call the Bush people and say, and they'd say, well, approximately, what do you mean approximately? You can't count? And so there has been, and, and this is something that the public has accepted, an, an approximation of everything at Guantanamo, which minimizes the ability of the press and the lawyers to, and the report and, and the researchers to talk about exactly what is going on, because you can always be questioned on your numbers if you're not given the numbers. So again, I say, and the same thing with the hunger strikes, we've come to the appropriate, what I think is the end point of this conversation. I think Guantanamo is fundamentally going to change, which is why, even though we're all very busy, I thought it would be worthwhile having this conversation to think about what the next steps are to bring about an end point. And I think the war, some of it is very much about a public conversation. Not, you know, the, the fact that the, uh, the Constitution Project report, the eruption of the hunger strike into consciousness, and the Boston bombing happened all within the same period of time has been, you, I'm surprised by the opposite, that Boston hasn't been used as a way to sort of let, you know, raise the cudgel against Guantanamo. It's taken on a lot of energy, even in that context. And I think it's just something for us to note in thinking about the, the, the controversies we're going to get in uh, going forward. I think the final thing is that this idea of hopelessness. There is a, a psychologist who's done a lot of work with the Guantanamo detainees and with some of the ones uh, accused uh, terrorists in the uh, prison system here, but mostly Guantanamo detainees, who has this theory now, and she had it on the eve of this hunger strike, of phobia of hope, and what it means not to have hope anymore. And my biggest worry is that the people like Carol and David and others who are working on this the Constitution project will give up hope. And so what I really want to say is the more attention the rest of us can focus on this, the more energy we can give them to do whatever they have to do to make sure it closes. So thank you for coming, and feel free to stay around and talk. <laughs>